Welcome to the Building in Public series with FlexPoint. We had an awesome episode one and two, and we're bringing you episode three today. I'm here with the CEO of FlexPoint, Travis, and we're going to be jumping into 2020, moving from the origin story into 2020 and what happened with FlexPoint as they launched. Travis, hand it over to you. Let's jump in. Yeah, sure. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, the start of 2020, this is the official launch of FlexPoint. Um, you know, it's a little bit different from what I think, you know, a lot of startups might have experienced in their official first year. Uh, maybe it's a little, maybe it's similar to like a Figma or something like that who builds for a while. But, uh, you know, we launched in 2020, but we had about four years of, uh, of growth, mostly on the, the back of inventory source, which you talked about in the last episode. Uh, and we had like a core of four to five, maybe six people over those four years that were kind of ready to go in 2020 and, and get this launch going for FlexPoint. Um, so yeah, we had grown from about 600K ARR when we joined all in about 2016. And uh, we're at about 2.5 million now at the start of 2020. Uh, I think it was like 2.2 actually, 2.2 million. So we're sitting there, new product. We've got 300K of that, uh, 2.2 was FlexPoint early adopters. Um, and I actually went back and I, I looked at it. it was, we actually had a total of 50 early adopters. I know I said last time we did a round of 20 to start but we didn't do another round of 10. Looking back, we actually did another round of three more rounds of 10. So we did, you know, we got actually got 50 people up on uh, FlexPoint before we even put it up on the website and, and launched it uh, publicly. So and for some, that's a whole business. That's a whole business right there with 30, 40, 50 right. people, um, especially as a software and service. Yeah, team. yeah, exactly. I mean, we were pretty excited to get those 50 customers um, and, and be sitting at 25K MRR, you know, 300K ARR before we even made it public. So. Um, so that's where we're at. That's that's January 2020. And so we've got inventory source, rock and roll. We've got US Direct, which I've talked a little bit about already, and I can talk more about that. But that, that business is running. Um, and FlexPoint is off and we're we're releasing it to the public here in January. So you know, we're starting to look at okay, should we should we raise money? So we go to the Florida Venture Conference um, down in Tampa and uh, we do our first kind of pitch and we, we start getting some interest and we're getting inbound interest as well. So we're Kind of in January, we're kind of going through this like we're not really trying to raise money, um, but we but we're interested in you know what what kind of valuation we would get, you know, and so we started to kind of refine yeah. our pitch. Uh, that was most of the early Q1, January, February, early March. We were starting to kind of just I was focused there at least, um, and the, a lot of the rest of the team was obviously focused on the release of FlexPoint, and you know, so we were looking at it. And it was kind of interesting trying to pitch inventory source, which was at that point what like 15 years old. Um, and then wow. FlexPoint is brand new with no real metrics other than like our early adopters have signed up. And then this, by the way, we've got this weird US direct thing, which is like a distributor thing, but we don't hold any inventory and all the revenues pass through. And uh, so it was an interesting uh, time of trying to pitch these three different businesses. One high churn, micro SMB, the inventory source, you know, market is a high churn drop shipping uh, for solopreneurs. I mean, that those guys come and go. and. You know, that's the nature of the business. Yeah. So trying to talk about that to VCs, um, talking about FlexPoint, really not proven out yet, explaining US Direct. So it was an interesting moment uh, for us to kind of go through that. But that was a good part of, of Q1 was that and we were growing too, right? We were growing, uh, we were hiring more people. Uh, I actually grabbed a bunch of cubes from, from somewhere and I put like eight cubes in the, in the office just from like a sound perspective. I still feel good about the decision to buy the cubes. Uh, but we bought these cubes and, um, and as soon as we bought them, COVID hits, right? Early March in uh, 2020. Oh, cool. So we had co we had these cubes sit for months without even people really using them. Um, but yeah, we, you know, that's Q1 basically is raising money and then COVID hit. That, that sounded like an interesting stage because you had this like legacy app, essentially this legacy software as a service. And then you have this new thing. And then you have the U.S. Direct in the middle and you're trying to coordinate all these different things and get down a pitch for each one, you know, manage each business, have the staffing for each business. And all this is going on where you're trying to, you know, inform folks around you what the actual pitch is, what the product's doing now, but then where it might go in the future. And then all of a sudden COVID comes along right when you're in this, you know, big step of growth phase. And so tell me a little bit what happened when, when COVID hits, you know, within the business. Yeah, sure. I you know, really was like a lot of companies was scary in that first couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, we weren't really sure what it was going to do to the business, to do our employees, to everyone in the world. Uh, so it was, it was a little weird, uh, but it, you know, we're, 
we're in e-commerce, we're in software, um, we're down in Florida. So net, net, like COVID ended up being, you know, a, a booster for us, a really good, a good thing, um, you know, for, for the business, at least obviously a, a horrible event and that some, I hope we never have to go through again, but uh, for, for the business, yeah. it was kind of, it did accelerate that growth, especially FlexPoint just being released. Um, you know, we saw that people were making this digital transformation or everyone thinks that people are only going to shop online for the rest of their life, right? Like that's a, you know, Shopify came out with yeah. some statement about how it pulled, you know, e-commerce forward. I think they said, I don't know, I don't want to misquote like a hundred years, but maybe I think it was 10 years. I, well, it pulled e-commerce forward, uh, you know, I'd say 10 years in technology, right? I mean, it definitely forced that. A lot of people who've been talking about a lot of brick and mortar retailers who've been kind of putting it off for a while, everyone was like, what's our e-commerce strategy? So, so yeah, we saw that. So, you know, we, we got to see that, but it was a double-edged sword for us because we had the U S direct business, which for those who don't know, it is a virtual distributor, which means that we provide products to a business, uh, to business customers, right. At a kind of discounted wholesale type rate. Um, but we are a virtual distributor in that we don't actually warehouse any inventory. We're just all drop shipping it through our, our network of drop ship distributors. And our value there is that we give you instant access to product, you know, 200,000 SKUs uh, without you having to go through all those different distributors and get signed up, get approved, uh, deal with all the different policies. We also give like a flat rate shipping policy uh, across all these different distributors and kind of like build all that in. So we're running this business as well. And all of our warehouses, all of our distributors are trying to figure out how to deal with uh, COVID protocol in the warehouse. So, you know, shipping delays and cancellations, yeah. everything was flying off the shelf. We had one that was, uh, one of our major distributors, uh, sells, you know, home and grocery and health food and things like that. And so grocery, uh, items from e-commerce sales were just, you know, flying off the shelf. So we were dealing with a lot of stock outs and cancellations and returns and refunds and fraud was showing up. So, you know, it was pretty crazy there. It, it definitely, we got stretched thin running these three different companies or products um, yeah. during that time where a lot was happening. So, yeah, so we saw that with the US direct side and then FlexPoint, it did, did help pull FlexPoint. And then while, while everything was going on, obviously inventory source too, right? Uh, very similar in the value proposition uh, was growing as well. So, um, so yeah, it was crazy. That's, that's insane to, to hear about and being a part of different companies at this time period. I can only resonate with being in Florida and having that advantage of that. Most things were open. We could kind of move around ebb and flow. My community was you know pretty well off, but we know that a lot of other areas had it worse. They had all these spikes of people getting sick and stuff, but the online e-commerce business was booming like crazy. And to your point, even what we've seen with logistics, it was more of an issue because people weren't just going and buying something for next week. They were stocking up on tons and tons of stuff. And so I didn't even think about how that could create such a issue short term as far as frequency and putting out fires with customers and all this kind of stuff during that time, even though it's a good thing. So it's kind of like that whole uh, lesson of just like growth through pain and being stretched and whatever, you guys had to do it in real time. You, there was no blueprint for a, a business like this. There was no book that you could read and say, well, this is most likely gonna happen. You know, it was totally different for everybody and really learning on the job. Um, but that makes me think about, okay, what was the team like during this time in 2020? Like, how are you guys operating? You know, what was the team up to? And, you know, maybe how did they respond to, to yeah, this growth? So we have, we. So we'd always been distributed. We had a team in India uh, since the start, and uh, we had about 14 people in the U.S. So that was different. We all kind of went and uh, went to our houses, but it wasn't a big deal, right? We've been used to taking Zoom calls and Slack and things like that. So, you know, we were 40 people in total at uh, the start of 2020. Um, 14 to 15 wow. in the U.S. We had 25 you know, plus in India. Um, and then, but the funny part is about 80% of those people had joined in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, you know, <laughs> so everyone's fresh. <rushing laughs> yeah. Cause we had seen so much, we'd seen some growth in us direct and, and inventory source us direct really helped fuel the growth in inventory source, which was the plan, right? It's not okay. like a, we're, we're not trying to generate revenue or profit with us direct. We're just trying to enable people to use our software. And so we saw a lot of growth in 2018 and 19. Right, getting us from that 600k to 2.2 million in ARR was mostly from US direct fueling inventory source. Um, and so we've seen that. So we hired a lot of people in that like, you know, 18 month period. So a lot of new people um, are, but it's funny, our go to market team was, you know, one sales rep. I was looking back at it, one sales rep, one partners manager and one marketing coordinator. 
and that was that was it um you know the trifecta of SaaS. yeah and we we added we added uh two uh at the start of 2020 like the end of q1 i think it was uh, of 2020 and i was doing sales for the first quarter i think before we added that was gonna be my question yeah i was doing it um at the start at the launch and we moved one of our sales reps over to partners manager i took over sales for like a month maybe two months when we transitioned from one sales rep that didn't work out to the two that we had long term that were two great sales reps one is still with us today um so yeah uh so there was not not a huge sales team because we didn't really we didn't really need one at the time we were all product like growth leading up to it but um small go to market team we had about five in customer success and support in the us three devs in the us uh, myself and the cto and that kind of made up the 14 and then india was all you know qa uh some development support and then actual 24 7 customer support so um, that was kind of what we looked like in 2020 we added about 10 to 12 i think by the end of that uh, year so we had another pretty uh it was at like 20 percent ish uh, we grew in that year by headcount as well yeah so you you outgrew the the lemon street house and had to move into this whole different environment of global operations yeah yeah exactly we moved uh i think i'm not sure it was 2019 i think it was 2019 or so we moved from the lemon house but yeah we we're in this new office but we ended up adding two offices we have one across the hall from each other now i think that went to 2020 when we did that um so we could yeah. support, you know, I think what ended up being at our height, you know, 20, 20 plus people in the U.S. Wow, that's incredible that to see that not just growth in uh, people, but I'm sure there was also during this time growth in revenue, too, because as you're bringing people on, you're investing during during a time that sounds like it was difficult to make that call, too, because you don't know where things are going to go. But you're kind of riding the wave, for lack of a better term, of growth and then kind of scaling up your teams, which is, you know, one of the best things I've ever heard is if you can kind of build while you're growing and, and hire on new staff, not just by headcount, but skills to free team members up for different uh, projects or, you know, sales, moving you out of sales and more strategic and all that kind of stuff. Like what was the revenue like during this time? Was there any shifts in that when all this was happening? Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a pretty good year. I mean, you know, from a growth perspective, we were at that 2.2 start. Um, U.S. Direct was doing its own thing revenue wise. We were doing probably 100K to 200K. Uh, looking back at just some quick math, you know, about in between 100, 200K a month. Um, so we did, you know, just under 2 million in U.S. Direct revenue, made about 200,000 in profit, um, you know, and, and on, on purpose, right? Like I said, it's most mostly pass through revenue, but it still was profitable just based on like how we try to kind of break even. Yeah. Um, so we had that kind of side and then, you know, the, the inventory source and flex point um, that went from the 2.2 to just over four. So uh, I think, you know, roughly, you know, 90% growth in, in ARR that year, which was pretty good. But the, the big thing was kind of really switching from uh, the, the share of uh, revenue from flex from inventory source to flex point. So um, looking at it again, yes. I think it was, yeah, inventory source was 3 million in uh at the end of 2020 and flex point did its first million like you know in the first year it grew from uh you know 300k or whatever in the early adopters and we were up to a million by the end of that year so we were pretty excited about not only inventory source growing a million by itself still with a competing product now to some extent but having flex point as a competing product that was three times the price of inventory source also grow a million dollars revenue at the same time that year yeah and something i've learned after kind of hearing you speak about these different things is like building you've built really an ecosystem within a large ecosystem there are these retailers and distributors and warehouses and there's tons of different products that surround them you guys kind of joined a, a large ecosystem and built your own and was able to drive revenue which is impressive enough for one business let alone three different businesses kind of working interchangeably with each other you know, bringing on new staff, people going through COVID, all of these different things, you know, it makes me wonder kind of, and be curious, were there any kind of major go-to-market strategies besides hard work? Obviously, we know the team worked their butts off during this period, but like, what was the go-to-market strategy, if you will, uh, to get to the success? And did you expect it? Yeah, our go-to-market in this first year, in 2020, uh, for FlexPoint, you know, we were lucky, lucky enough to have like a starving crowd. Right? Have you ever heard that saying of, you know, the best product strategy or go-to-market strategy is to have a starving crowd? And so yeah. we definitely did. We, we, heard, uh, we heard those customers speak loudly throughout the first couple of years with Inventory Source. And so we went to market with FlexPoint. That's why we we're able to get 50 customers so quickly on the beta. And that's why we we're able to grow to a million dollars. We really were just uh, taking customers from Inventory Source and saying, if you're willing to pay three times, four times the amount 
and uh, go to FlexPoint, here's all the features and benefits that you've been asking for. And so, you know, that, that really helped us. That was our go-to-market strategy was upselling our current funnel. And we were, we were getting, and we still get, you know, de depending on uh, the year or whatever it might be, but we get about 150 uh, customers a, a day signing up for our free directory and inventory source. So that, that's, that was our funnel. And it's still our funnel to, to some extent today. We've built out different channels as well for FlexPoint. But yeah, 150 customers just signing up for a free directory um, per day really kind of helps, you know, uh, the top of the funnel for sure. So we would do that. We had a motion where our account executives would reach out. They sign up for inventory source. Hey, looks like you signed up. We take a lot of information down on kind of what their business looks like. If they're doing order volume already, right? Are they somewhat qualified? And we would move them through a motion of our, our sales reps kind of reaching out and seeing like, Hey, inventory source is great. It might work for you. Um, but you know, here's why you might want to consider flex point. And that was, that was our go to market mostly. Um, we did start some paid ads. Uh, we did a little bit of paid ads. You know, we've kind of done that over the years. We, we got the blog going, started ranking for things around like, you know, Shopify bulk editor, you know, things like that, where we know people yeah. are dealing with large catalogs and, and things like that on different platforms. Yeah. So we did some SEO uh, strategies there as well, which started to gain traction. Um, the partnerships as well that we've always had with our suppliers and our channel partners um, were other go to market. So we, you know, with that small go to market team, we were able to kind of execute on a lot of different channels, but, um, but yeah, it, it was mostly, you know, that starving crowd sitting right there in front of us and us just being able to capitalize on it. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And obviously it, it wasn't e easy. One of the things that, um, sticks out to me now, just when you're talking about running ads and stuff, that's also a time and place thing. We know ads are much harder yeah. to run now and Shopify now has like trademarks against most of their keywords. So even if you're running ads, Google kind of knocks them down and they don't run as good anymore. And people are seeing that across the ecosystem. So really doing that ad and SEO at a time when that was really what grew businesses. So it's also like I'm discovering that's one of the hardest things too, is when you're building out these businesses, there is a time and place to do certain marketing activities that are going to drive revenue and drive growth, but you can't always just do the same thing. Maybe it sits there and operates and you let it run. But, but what's most impressive, I think, and um, not to fanboy too much over here is the process of bringing in people through a mechanism or a tool first that then leads your team to be able to qualify them into a, a higher product to grow that average contract value is what businesses are trying to scramble to do today. And you guys were doing that a little bit before and it wasn't quite the freemium model. People always do that, but this qualification of customers, and it sounds like you still do some of this in your work today, but doing that at that time is, is incredible. Um, so yeah, kudos to you guys. Well, yeah, I gotta give credit to like what I inherited too, where that directory, the supplier directory is one of the best lead magnets I've ever had accessible to me in any kind of marketing position. And, uh, you know, that's, that really has been, been great for, for driving growth, right? It's like the ultimate ebook, right? You talk about let's put together an ebook and get yes. email signups, but if you have like a live directory of products that can be drop shipped with all this rich product data and supplier information. I mean, that, that is, um, it's hugely valuable to our customers. So it, it made things a little bit easier. Going back again to 2020, you know, you go through this building stage, staffing, COVID, um, you know, you, you're getting this product out to people and you're growing pretty quickly. That makes me wonder is your CS team has to be like, Hey, we're getting a request for like this feature, yeah. this product, product, or this is what's going on. Did you guys have to start rolling out new features? Yeah, we did. You know, we've always, I mentioned this last episode, but you know, we've had a good, we had a great team, a great development team. We had some really um, core developers here in the U.S. that were could spin up features very quickly, and so and we still do today. Uh, so we, we we were not shy about rolling out features, which kind of has bit us a little bit uh, long term. And you know <laughs> we want to make sure we stay focused. But in this year, we rolled out a ton. Um, in 2020, I was going back and looking at it, and yeah, you know, we rolled out kidding and bundling, uh, a category management tool. We rolled out our rate shopping, where we basically integrate the Ship Engine. Uh, to look across these different carriers and say, you know, this is the, the cheapest rate, which is familiar, where a lot of people are familiar with, but we were able to do that not only just with the carriers, but look across the multiple sources as well, which is kind of a layer on top, right? Like we know that this, Definitely. your warehouse supports this carrier. We know that this dropshipper supports that carrier. And we know there's like a difference in distance on where it needs to be shipped from. And so taking that carrier data and getting the estimated shipping costs across multiple sources was a game changer to really be able to take our larger customers order management and order routing to the next level um, so that was a really that was a huge one just really taking our advanced order routing up a notch and allow us to close bigger deals 
that was uh, that's really the, the genesis behind that uh, concept of committed stock, right? The the idea that um, when an order comes in, make sure you commit it even if before you ship it out, so you don't oversell in other channels. Uh, we even got into transfer right. orders, right, and, and purchase orders that weren't necessarily drop ship, which kind of stretched us into like that OMS um, and, and kind of IMS side of things. Um, we did accounting integrations to QuickBooks Online was the only one at the time, uh, but we did accounting integrations and we started supporting EDI. As much as people don't want to support EDI and say it's archaic, it is, uh, the big guys want it, the big guys need it. So um, we needed to support as an integration okay. platform in retail, we had to support EDI. So we rolled that out in the first year of Flexpoint. All those different features coming out of like one year is incredible enough. People usually pick like one or two and you guys have a ton of them here. And it sounds like it was a response to seeing there's a real want and need from your customer and versus overthinking it at this time of growth, you rolled it out quickly, which is a huge advantage one against new competitors or people in the marketplace trying to copy a feature and build a SaaS product around it. You're like, no, we have it all right here. You don't need to go somewhere else. You don't need to have multiple tools. And it's all fixed in with this price that we're giving you where you don't have 20 different things that you're paying for, which today is the biggest issue for most SaaS companies and businesses in general is all these tools that add up at the end of the month. You know, they're cheap when you add them on one and one by one, but when you're doing all these different things to provide the features that you have and to mix in not only the products, the different sources, the different destinations, but then even accounting, which is another major aspect that companies spend a lot on. Uh, really is ahead of its time and we know it's going to continue to grow. So thanks so much for sharing all this information. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with the audience and give them a heads up? This is like a crash course on uh, running a startup, by the way. So it's you're learning a lot that um, you can put into the field and practice. Even though this happened in 2020, you could put it in practice in 2024. Yeah, no, I think that was most of what, you know, when I went and looked back at 2020, I looked at old presentations and emails and documents. And I think that was kind of the you know, what we did in 2020. And I you know, just hope this is, I think this is pretty interesting for me, obviously, and I know internally in the team and, and kind of looking back, but, you know, we'd love to hear from our customers more on kind of what they would want us to dig into. Um, you know, I think right now we plan on talking about the revenue and the features are rolling out and different kind of themes of each year. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's always fun to look back at these and hope people are enjoying it. Well, thanks guys for tuning in to FlexPoints Building in Public. Stay tuned for the next episode. You can catch on LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. Join us. We'd love to have you as part of the conversation.